Here we talked about a multi layer neural network, not a linear perceptron, it also has a non linear activation function. Now we will see how such, such a neural network, which may have many number of hidden layers, so called deep neural network, is popularly used for automatic speech recognition. How neural network is used to model the acoustic properties of speech sound. The traditional GMM HMM used a hidden Markov model. It's a sequence of states. Let us consider one context dependent phone, a triphone. A word spoken Samson. The pronunciation of Samson is it's a sequence of six sounds S, A, M, S, O, N. This corresponding spectrogram is here. From this spectrogram, short, short duration, something like 20 millisecond, we compute a set of features which could be 13 dimensional MFCC with their slopes and their curvatures. 39 dimensional feature vector. A feature vector features or a feature vector is computed every 10 millisecond and matched with each of the such contact dependent phones. Consider one such contact dependent phone is a hidden Markov model which has multiple states. Each is associated with a probability density function which models the likelihood that a, the given feature vector is generated by this state. It's a likelihood that the state generated this uh, feature vector. So in this particular case, we are, we are talking of shared context dependent phones or the xenons. And let's say there are 10,000 xenons, shared states, and each xenon is given a number, zero order. In this particular case, the S in the left context of silence and the right context of A is given a number 942. So the first few feature vectors uh, corresponds to the Xenon number 942. And after that, after a couple of few feature vectors, the oval A started and the corresponding Xenon is number 6. So it's a sequence of states is associated with the Gaussian mixture model. The acoustic model is not a normal distribution. It doesn't have a single bell curve, but it has multiple modes, multiple peaks. So this is a Gaussian mixture model, GMM. Each state is associated with the Gaussian mixture model. What does the Gaussian mixture model uh, models? It models the likelihood conditional property that the, the state HMM generated the input feature X. X given the state. State is already known. What is the likelihood that this particular state generates this MFCC or this format frequency? The likelihood. What we are interested in speech recognition is X is given or a sequence of X is given. We want to know the corresponding state sequence or the phone sequence, the posterior probability. When we use HMM DNA with HMM, the GMM here is replaced by DNA. That's the first point. Second, DNN does not provide likelihood. Instead, it directly provides the posterior probability of the state given the input. A deep neural network approximates the posterior probability. Not, so what is the posterior probability? X feature vector is given. What is the probability of the different states or the different forms? Whereas in HMM, what is used is a likelihood that is the probability of the conditional probability x given s whereas what neural networks give is the posterior probability of the state given the input vector x. But 
we can still continue to use the HML because of its ability to model a sequential pattern. But the HML expects this like DNN approximates this. So we can ex you can compute this likelihood using the base root condition property. So the probability of the uh, posterior probability of the state given the input x into the probability of the x itself, probability of the feature vector itself, divided by the a priori probability of the state or the focus. That's given here. Whatever the output of DNA, multiply by a constant because probability of x is a constant as far as maximization of this posterior probability divided by the state value. So, what has changed here is from the feature to the x of s is computed by a deep neural network. There are, there are, in this particular case, there are two hidden layers. There could be many hidden layers. The change from GMM HMM to DNN HMM is primarily replacement of GMM by DNN and also apply this base protocol. very popular in the last 5-7 years but the concept itself of using neural networks along with the HMM is not it's, it was proposed as early as 1994 something like 25 years ago quarter century ago by these people the multi-layer perceptron they used at that time it computes the probability, posture probability of the phones given x. So, what is this? This is probability, posture probability of the phone or the state given the input vector x. And during the training, this is estimated using the trained data. This, how, we know how to train a neural network, we just do that now. But error back propagation algorithm will train, will update the weights of the neuron so as to maximize the correct phone length this is posture problem during the recognition the multi-layer perceptron estimates this probability from that we compute the probability of x given s using the base rule that we saw in the previous slide and feed it to the hmm use the return algorithm alignment and we get the word seekers, word hypothesis. What has changed from there to here? Earlier, we used to use one or two hidden layers. And there was even a theory which said that, a theoretical paper which said that if there are two hidden layers, that is sufficient to map any complex mapping. That sort of um, kind of acted as a barrier to applying multiple uh, here layers, but more than that, people didn't just believe that they tried with the increasing the number of hidden layers. But by increasing the number of hidden layers, they did not find a significant improvement in the accuracy of the multi layer perceptron. That later turned out that that, re, re, that lack of improvement was due to the limitation of the training. Then we will come to that. But the idea hasn't changed. What has changed in the modern deep neural networks where there are multiple hidden layers is a context driven HMM states were used, whereas in that 1994 they talked of context independent phones. Now we use context dependent HMM states. Uh, deeper next, multiple, many layer hidden layers uh, instead of the single hidden layer as was used. In this particular case, they use multi-layer uh, multi perceptron. Perceptron is linear activation function, whereas one uses non-linear activity the hidden function. Uh, since number of hidden layers are large, there are large number of weights or the parameters to model the mapping from the input to the output class labels. Large number of parameters, lot more flexibility. But it also requires large number of training data to estimate this large number of parameters. Training data become, became available in the past decade 
uh, and that is uh, one of the prime reasons for the success of the DNN-based ASR. Uh, people uh, talk of several layers, three versus three to seven million layers. Uh, computers they became fast. The computations could be done um, using GPU clusters or in the cloud. And there are many article choices. Instead of sigmoid, people use tan hyperbolic or ray loop function. And people tried using what is known as pre-training. Initially, it gave better result, but with a large number of data, pre-training, the so-called pre-training also did not matter. So these days, one doesn't talk of this, but uh, pre-training using bottle neck features was tried before large amount of data was available. One of the things that people tried was working with the different activation functions. We had used activation function which gives output between 0 and 1. Instead one can use a time hyperbolic function which takes the input and the x-axis from minus infinity to plus infinity but the output will be limited to between minus 1 and plus 1. This is a time hyperbolic function. Uh, but time hyperbolic function limits output here minus 1 to plus 1. But people have tried with the other functions. One of them is called rectified linear unit. Many times it is just called as ReLU units. Rectified linear units. It's linear. When the input is positive, the output is positive. It's just a straight line in 45 degrees. Okay? F of x equal to x. But when the input is negative, output is 0. So the ReLU function is this. Up to 0, it is like this. Then onwards, it is straight line in 45 degrees. F of x equal to x. The input is negative, do nothing. If the output is positive, just pass it on. There have been variations of this. This instead of oh, in, in, when the input is negative, instead of become zero, they make it somewhat some some minor input they give. So various for changes to these activation functions are in Relu has been a, one of the popular activation functions in the current. The formula for the ReLU is here. There were, I, I said, there were the initial stages of the DNS from five years ago, people tried increasing the number of layers and various improvements were tried. One of them was so called pre training using bottleneck features. The other is generalization of the neural network. It's good for us to know what this generalization means. When you train a neural network or any pattern recognition, you give it a, using supervised training mode, learning mode, you give it several examples of the various classes and along with the class labels. So you, you ask the, you apply the learning algorithm so that its parameters in case of GMM, it could be mean and covariance matrix, mean vector and covariance matrix. In case of DNN, it could be weights of the arcs. These could be changed so as to minimize the error. The, to minimize the error that it makes when it recognizes the training data. So, because that is the seeing data, it, it minimizes the error of the training data. What happens when a new data comes in, which may not, which may, whose characteristic may be slightly different from the data that it has already seen, the so-called test data or unseen data. The performance of the system in general is less on unseen data than the seen data of the training data. So quite often, for this reason, one uses the so-called development data to tune the parameter of the model uh, and then report the results on the test data. We divide the data into three parts, training data, development data and test data. 
The other method of evaluation is K fold evaluation. Divide the entire database into K equal parts, nearly representative parts. Use K minus 1 parts for the training and use the remaining one part as the testing to find out the result and use a different combination of K minus 1 parts and so on. Do this K times and report the average on the K such recognition experiments. The generalization is a method of adjusting the parameters or tuning the parameters so that the system's performance on unseen data will come closer to that of the seen data. That's the generalization. One of the methods people had tried out is so-called dropout. Again, it is still some, sometimes used here. That's why I'm talking about it here. Yeah? This is the neural network, a standard neural network. Input layer, first hidden layer, second hidden layer, and output layer. All the weights are active. What you can do is, when you train the system, you can randomly pick up, let's say, 10% of the neurons and say that these neurons do not participate in, in this particular iteration of the training. Training is done with training. Which means that this doesn't participate means it doesn't take input, it doesn't take output. All these weights are set to zero, artificially. Rank. Which neurons to pick up? Not alternating neurons of the thing, randomly you pick up. What is the advantage of this? If the, the neural network will learn to produce the correct output even when some of the neurons are inactive. It is like simulating error in an electronic circuit. By doing this, and next, in next iteration, this may be active, this may be inactive. Which means that the system adjusts its parameters such that even if a small number of neurons are inactive or get in incorrect, do not behave properly, it will still give the better result on the unseen data. That is called a generalization scheme. So this is called a dropout, means make certain number of neurons inactive, randomly picked up. Finally, what it turns out that none of these things matter as much if you have a large amount of data. People tried with the different, these are the standard databases, Switchboard and Fisher, English databases. People tried with Switchboard database, which is over the telephone channel, talking over the telephone channel, so it's called Switchboard. In good old days, the telephone channels used to be switched by operators manually. So they trained using 300 hours of data. There were nearly 5,000 speakers. ASA system, based on this amount of data, alone did some recognition accuracy. In addition to this, <coughs> they started with a much larger database. What, what do you mean by larger? Instead of 300 hours, it's 2,000 hours. Order of magnitude higher. Number of speakers are also much higher. They start with a large amount of data and train the system and at the end you all adapt it to this particular database. In that case, the system gave better performance when it started with a neural network that was trained on a larger database. So this scheme has become popular these days, especially for low resource languages. You train, you start, you train a system using large amount of data for a high resource language, high resource preferably related language. For example, if you want to uh, train a system for Assamese, start with Hindi data because there will be a lot of data and then adapt it to this new language, yes, uh, Assamese. The performance of the system will be better than using just the few uh, small amount of data of the new language. Building a strong deep neural network based acoustic model. The neural network is large, it will have three or more layers, we typically use five layers, it requires a large amount of training data. What has become less important as we see along is regularization, specific optimization algorithm, 
And even the initialization with the pre-training that we need to do and things like that doesn't matter. But if you are training it with a large amount of data of a related language, that does happen. A few other uh, slides. This is a tutorial overview of usage of the deep neural networks for acoustic modeling in ASR. This is a magazine that is easier to read. This is a good uh, review paper, not very far. Eh? The, the one of the prime movers of uh, uh, the deep neural network for speech recognition gave a tutorial in result and a slide from that shows how deep neural network and HNN are combined to model the acoustic properties of the species. And we already saw this uh, kind of diagram. Things that have changed is large number of hidden layers. Each hidden layer, neurons, there are a lot of nonlinear transformations. Also, earlier we used to take speech frame, which is typically 25 millisecond long. Now we do take that, but we take a, a, a much larger acoustic window, time durations of 0.1 second, 0.2 second, so that it takes into account medium term. A variation. So GMM was used to model a state of the HMM. Now DNN models it. Uh, and this replacing the GMM by DNN in HMM did increase, did improve the performance. It decreased the error rate by using the DNN. Uh, specifically, if you see the effect of the training data. The switchboard data, if you use 309 hours, the perform the errors are 23.6% uh, using GMM, using DNN, it reduces drastically. Now, instead of 309 hours, use 2000 hours, an order of magnitude, then the error reduces further. So, you see that the demont, large amount of speech data is necessary to train large number of parameters. Uh, seven layers and there are 2000 neurons in each layer. So many, lots of billions of parameters, we need large amount of data. So it appears, as if at least right now at least, that the, it is the data, large amount of train data, that's training data, that seem to um, guide the uh, performance of the ASR system. This is a list of the readings that you know. And we, Kali has become a popular toolkit. We continue to use the Kali toolkit. So here, uh, so this is uh, where I stop as per the acoustic models for automatic speech recognition.